Welcome to the fourth session in our Academy on Computers. And this program is all about storing information. And our expert Jim Butterfield and three guests will be here to help us with some demonstrations. Jim, why is the whole issue of storage so important to computer users? It's important in two ways, Jack. First of all, there's the storage within the computer. That's the RAM memory that we've looked at before. That's the storage that gives the computer its power because that's where the programs are held and the more memory you have here, the bigger the program you can put in. But there's a different kind of storage, and that's the kind of storage that we hold external to the computer, on disk or on cassette tape. That's where we hold our data files and the information. Let me see if I can give you an example of the contrast between the two different kinds of storage. If I were working out some scientific or engineering calculation, say designs of a bridge or something like that, I might want to hold a large, do a large amount of computation, a lot of trigonometric, a lot of geometry and things like that, I'd need a great deal of memory in here to hold a big program to do complex things. But on the other hand, if I wanted to handle something like information on the registrants of the academy, then I'd want a lot of external storage because that's data. I don't need the processing power, I need the data power. So there's a reason for having both of those, you size them to the kind of computer application you have. And this, this external comes off cassette or disk, right? Right. I have, for example, here a cassette that contains a small mailing list. So we have names and addresses stored on the cassette, and that's a reasonable and inexpensive way of holding data. On the other hand, I have here a, a, uh, a floppy disk which contains a number of files with quite a number of different pieces of information. And since I can get the information faster and go directly to it here, it tends to be more convenient. In a way, you can say that whether you have a cassette or a disk, having one drive gives you access to unlimited information. For example, I could have one single disk drive, not the dual drive we see here, and I could plug in one disk, and then another disk, and then another disk, and I could get unlimited information from even a single disk drive. Well, with unlimited access like that, why would you need two disk drives is the next question. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a good question, Jack, and it's a very easy one to answer. You can often use two disk drives together. For example, I might bring in information from this drive, process it in some way, and store it out on a different disk on the other drive. I'd be copying the information through from one to the other. That might be very convenient. Here's another example. Suppose I had here a disk that contained the names and addresses of a large number of customers. Here I have perhaps a different disk that contains their transactions, what they have purchased lately, what payments they have made, and so on. Now, when it comes to time to send out the bills, I want to plug in both disks so that we can draw in the information from the two different drives and use them together to print the new statements or invoices or whatever we're doing. So you can use the two disks together. Right? Yes, and in fact, it's very common mm -hmm. to find two disks in operation at the same time. All right, the amount of data, then, that my computer can handle mm -hmm. is based not on the internal memory, but on the external devices, right? That's correct, yeah. All right, so a 32K computer, mm -hmm. could it handle, let's say, 400K of, of data? Absolutely. Well, how could it do that? Well, I think sometimes we get confused because we think in terms of programs. If I had on this disk, for example, a program that were, say, 16K in size, I'd certainly expect to load that program entirely into the computer's memory, and, of course, then I'd need 16K to hold that program. But that isn't true of data files. What happens is that if I have a data file that's huge, for example, 400K, as you said, we'd never have to have the entire data file in memory. Here's what we'd do. We'd bring in one piece of information, one record, one name and address. We'd process it, print it, and then we wouldn't need it anymore, and we could make that space available to bring in the next record. So we could handle this huge amount of data, and we wouldn't need a great deal of storage in our computer to do that. All right. Can we see a, a com the computer working with some, some data you uh, have stored? Yes. I have some files on this disk, and I think I can show you a couple of programs in operation. All right. So it's on disk. That'd be random access? Uh, well, not exactly, Jack. Okay. Let me finish loading this, and then I'll talk about that. The disk itself is random access, and what that means is we go straight to the program that we need on disk, or we go straight to the data file we need on disk. But that brings us to the beginning of the data file. Once we're there, we have to go through it sequentially, one record after the other, if we have what is called 
a sequential disk file. That's what I have here. It's a list of magazine articles, and these magazine articles are on the file, one behind the other, and when we run this program, what we'll see is the various articles coming up there. The screen's moving pretty fast. You can see it comes up quickly enough, but each article is one behind the other. Uh, what we have here is the date the article was published, uh, information on reprinting, information on corrections or updates, and the name of the article itself. Now, if I wanted to go for this one right here, I would have to read through all of the previous articles in the list. In other words, I have to work my way through, and that's why we call the file sequential. Remember, we get to it straight away, but we must read it one article after the other. That's called a sequential file. Now, there is another kind of file which is used on a computer, sometimes called a random access file. Other names for it are sometimes a direct file or a relative file. We can bring in information on this kind of file, whatever we call the name, we can bring that information in, not just starting at the beginning of the file, but we can go straight to the place on the file where we need that information. If you like, think of it this way, and I'll show you one of these in a moment. With a regular file, we go to the beginning of the file, looking at the directory first with a hop and a skip. But with a relative file, we go not just to the beginning of the file, but to the actual piece of information we want with a hop, a skip, and a jump. Let's see how that works. The program is asking me, the program, to read this data file. Do I want instructions? I'll say no. And now it's ready to ask me which stock do I want. If I ask for stock number 10, it does not have to look through stock number 1, number 2, number 3, and so on. It will go straight to stock number 10. Let me type in 10, return, and almost immediately, there it is. It didn't have to find its way through. Let me go back and look for stock number 6, for example, and immediately go to that point of the disk doesn't have to wade through the others. It can go to any so stock at once. So this is random or direct as opposed to sequential, right? right. This is a random access file. It's another di kind of data file on disk. All right. Now, one more question. When do I use, when is best to use sequential and when is it best to use random? Well, you have to decide what your needs are, Jack. For example, if you have a small file, it's no problem going through it sequentially, one item after the other. It doesn't take much time anyway. And besides which, Sequential files are simpler and a little bit easier to handle than relative files. Uh, once again, if you have a moderately large file, but it doesn't change much, it's probably easiest to use a sequential file because you don't need to change it very often and there's no, no difficulty going through it. So just as in when I'm buying a computer, when I'm setting up my file system, I must know what my needs are. You tailor the, fi the file according to whatever you need to do. Right. Thanks very much, Jim. Jim and I will be right back after this message with our guest, and some more demonstrations. Attention Academy participants, as this is the fourth week of the Computer Academy, we would like to request that you complete the answer sheet for questions one to nine in the correspondence connection, which can be found in part four of your participants guide beginning on page 29. The sooner you return your responses in the envelope provided, the sooner we can respond to you. Now, back to the Academy. Jim and I have three guests with us who are going to show us how they use their computers as filing and storage systems. We have a courtroom lawyer, a librarian and teacher, and a freelance photographer who is also an at-home computer user. Jim, over to you with our first guest. Andrew, how are you? Hi, Jim. You have an interesting machine here. I see it's a digital deckmate. You don't see too many of those in the average home. No, they've only recently descended to the level of that people can actually afford them for home use. That's an increasing market for digital now. And I understand digital have a smaller model now for the home called the Rainbow. Yes, the Rainbow, that's true. Very good. You have a database, so you have an information base set up on this machine. I wonder if you'd show us how it works. One of the primary features of this is that as we create documents in the court process, it indexes that information so I can retrieve it later on. I index it by the type of document that is. Mm -hmm. For example, we're going to have a look here now at something called a Supreme Court writ. Now, if we come down to have a look at that writ, I've called it up from the database, and you can see that there are certain blanks still in that document. I see. So it's a document. Now, that's a, a document you've called up from disk, but it still has parts missing on it. That's right. And what we're going to do now is merge information from another database. This database is that client information. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, here we're calling up something that shows us that Peter Pan is being sued by Snow White. I see. So you don't have to type in that information yourself. 
You bring it in from another database, and you're blending these two together. That's right. And slowly, block by block, we create that new piece of information relying on what we already have in our database. Very good. Is this the only thing that you do on your home computer? No, it does, it does a great deal more than that. For example, I can ask it what I want to do tomorrow, which files are up for review, which files have to go to court by the end of the week, and in that way, keep me on top of it as a diary or a calendar system. It does accounting. It also does a bit of uh, larger database retrieval. So you keep many different kinds of data on there, as well as the program. What kind of a program file do you have here? Is this sequential or random access? It's random access in that all of those documents can be accessed at random, but within each document, it then is sequential. Once you're in a document, you have to start at the beginning and go to the end or move around linearly through that document. So you have a mixture. It's a mixture. It's a powerful mixture. Very good. Thank you. We'll take a look at a new application here. This one is a genealogical system. Marion, how are you? Fine, thanks. Very good. You'd like to show us, I see you have a Radio Shack TRS-80 here. Mm -hmm. And you're using this one to trace your uh, family tree? That's right. Very good. Would you tell us about it, please? Okay. What I've done is I've taken a, a basic program that I typed in from a magazine, and I was then able to enter all the data from my family research that I've done. Mm -hmm. And the key thing for me is that I can print out family charts. You'll see on this one that this is a, a predecessor's chart. That is, here I am, and these are my predecessors. Okay. It's a very difficult thing to do manually, mm -hmm. and when I put the data into the computer, I can call up any chart I want for anybody on this particular chart. So the actual job of printing up that chart is a lengthy and tedious one, and the computer is saving you a lot of that tedium. Yes, and it also means that I don't have to repeat myself. That is, I can call up charts for anybody here. Very good. I'd like to see that in action in a moment, but first, you said something while we were talking. You said it was a basic program that you put in. Did you mean basic fundamental or the computer language the basic? The computer language basic. Okay, good. Would you like to show us this program? All right. In addition to printing something out, I can have something displayed on the screen. Mm -hmm. And I can choose what type of entry. I've chosen the whole entry. Mm -hmm. And I'll pick last name, and I'll ask for anyone with the last name of La France. It takes a few minutes to go through because I have 473 records in so far. And Let me I ask you about that. Is that a sequential file or is it random access? It's a random access file. It's a random access, but it still takes a while to find that That's particular right. name, LaFrance. Okay. We found the first instance of a LaFrance. I've got a Brad LaFrance here. And you'll notice that it gives me basic information about these people that once again, in my manual systems before I had this, I had to keep writing out. And if it changed, I had to erase it and try to keep track of all the information. Now I can go in and just update my records whenever I get new information. So what your system is doing for you is just helping to trace the linkage between the various items that you have in yes, there. Yes, and this is what does the linkage. I found out, of course, who the relations are, but mm -hmm. the system itself makes those links, and that's what makes those charts possible. So it can follow its way through the file and find the right people that that's you want right. for a given circumstance. So this is my first LaFrance. Now if I call up the second one, I have a Lisa LaFrance. So when you search for LaFrance, you search for all of them. That's right, in this case. Are there any and more? I can keep going through. Mm -hmm. There should be another one. And a David LaFrance. Very good. And I could ask for a chart from these which would print out in the same way, mm -hmm. but of course resort all the information rather than me resorting at all. So it would be a personalized family exactly. tree in this case. I can make it personalized for anybody in the family. Lovely. Thank you very much. We'd like to turn to another application. We have a professional photographer here who keeps track of his negatives by means of a computer database. Arnold, how are you? Fine, thanks. Very good. Now, we have here an Apple II computer with a couple of disk files on it, and I see you already have something on the screen. It looks yeah. something like a window or a box. Yes. Basically, you can think of this as a, just a, like exactly like a file card, mm -hmm. and this particular database is just like file cards. You don't change the shape of them. Mm -hmm. You set up a, you design your own template with the titles you want, and then you fill it in, store them away, and on one of these disks you have just thousands and thousands of file cards, and you can find one of them in a fraction of a second. Okay, now a template's like a plan. Yes, yeah, so let me draw up my template here. Uh, I'll say get it. And there's the template. It's gone through the disk and found where the template is. And uh, there you can see the headings marked off and some sample information filled in, so if someone else is filling it in, 
they can see how the sort of format that I'm going to use. Okay, now, as I understand it, that template isn't your data file, it's just a picture of what your data file looks like. That's right. And what you can do is either you can fill in the blanks by typing in, right, or you can fill in the blanks by calling up information from disk. That's right. Would you like to call up some information sure. from disk? Uh, let's say I'll just uh, clear the screen out, and I'm going to ask for uh, um, a file on uh, all my files with uh, negatives on the, the, the brass group, the Canadian brass, for example. Okay, so I type in Canadian brass. Okay, these are photographic negatives that you have on file. That's right. It, it can't uh, get it if you spell Canadian wrong, right? That's absolutely <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And there's the first uh, record, and I can just continue on through the record by hitting return, and mm -hmm. it will rapidly retrieve one record after another. Okay, and, and I, I understand that you can go after combinations of circumstances. Yes. We haven't got time to talk about it. Now, tell me one thing. The information that you have stored on this disk, is this sequential or random access? Well, it's uh, random access by the keywords, which are very mm -hmm. rapid sorting, but then this can also look through all, each card, and it does that in a sequential way, but it's still much faster than many of the sequential methods that are used. Okay, very good. Thank you, Arnold. Jim, some interesting uses of computer filing systems, but I'm sure you have some general questions you'd like to ask. Yes, I'd like to put some questions to our guests about data and how it's to be used and how it can be useful in computers. First, I'd like to ask about what you shouldn't do with data. For example, if you have a list of valuables around your home, your television set, and so on, and there's serial numbers, is that the sort of thing that you'd put on a computer database? Marion. Certainly. It's a means of storing it and being able to print out updated lists of it, as I have done with the genealogical information. Mm -hmm. You might be well wise to hide it under an unusual file name. So they might steal your computer, too, otherwise, and then you'll lose your information. Okay, what sort of things would you not put on a database? Are there things that really aren't suitable, Arnold? I wouldn't put my recipes in a database. I, the, the, they kept in the cookbooks, and you can just dig them up very quickly. And it's a lot of extra work sitting at the keyboard typing all that stuff in. And so things are available in printed form, and things maybe you can do better with pencil and paper you wouldn't want to do in a database. Okay. I'd like to ask you about how your information is stored. I see everybody here has their information stored on disk. Is that universal? Is that the way to keep your information? There are other ways. I understand that Arnold keeps some of his information on cartridges. Yes, I, I, I like to use cassettes for archival storage. Mm -hmm. uh, the cassette is very durable and it holds a lot of information. I can put six years of business records on a C90. Audio, standard audio cassette. So you can keep all sorts of historical records back yeah. there. I wonder about storing data on magnetic surfaces like disks and cassettes and things like that. Aren't you ever afraid it's going to get wiped out? Well, one of the strange things is that, yes, they are sensitive, but for that reason you make backups. And those backups are actually very portable. You take the backup and put it in your safety deposit box. I survived a fire once for that very reason, because we had backups. Uh, sitting at home that I could recreate the database from. Okay, you said you survived the fire. You mean your database survived, I hope? Well, both of us survived. Uh, the fireman and I, we raced up the stairs and rescued not the computer, but the floppy disks that were lying around the place. I see. But you, so your information was more important. You could replace the computer, but those disks That's right. were invaluable. The computer actually survived as well, thankfully. But is that generally true? Are there other things you need to do to make sure your data is safe? It's useful sometimes to store it off-site. Um, Andrew has just mentioned that you can store it in your safe deposit box. If it's something that you don't want to lose, as I wouldn't want to lose the amount of work I put into this, I would store it someplace else, outside of the house. Good. We've heard some of the people here referring to key fields and sometimes the index on their information. That seems to be, most people think of that as the way the information is sorted, alphabetically or whatever. Do you have key fields on all of your information? Is it is it necessary to your data database? I, I have uh, I choose key fields and they're for very rapid access. But I wouldn't use a database that wouldn't allow key fields to be shifted around so that something that is a minor piece of information couldn't be changed into a key field later. You don't always know what key fields you want to keep that information under. Sometime later on, you may discover a need for information that can only be accessed to, uh, other than the keys that you've created. Okay, I'd like to ask about that, Tim. Database. Everybody says database now. Don't you just have files anymore, data files to tell it? What, what is this? Do we have to add prestige to our information by calling it a database? Are we misusing this term? Marion. 
I don't think so. You're putting data in and you're creating a base of that data that you can then search and sort upon. I sometimes think about some of my other files as just files because they're done in my word processor and I don't have the same kind of sort facilities that I have in my database. Okay, I'd like to talk about planning. When you're planning a system, when you're putting it together, how carefully do you have to plan to get your information right when you start things up? What do you think, Arnold? I don't like to plan too carefully. It's a lot of work, and, I, and, I, and it takes away some of the spontaneity of discovering what you might use it for later on. You're recommending not planning? Uh, in a sense, in that you, you use something that is quite flexible so that you can modify uh, a great deal later. Uh, my experience was I put in, uh, typed in a long database, put in 100 items of camera equipment, and discovered that I, my field was one letter too short for one of the serial numbers, and I ended up having to type it all in again. And I, at that point, decided I wanted something that would, could be modified in any way later on. Everybody agree with this? If you don't have something flexible, and Arnold's very lucky to have that, I don't. I have to do a lot of planning at the beginning. I have to think through the various fields, and in my case, I particularly have to think about what I want to index, because I can't index every field in some of the software that I have. Over planning can inhibit imagination, which is an important thing when you're developing a database. But surely you have to plan. How hard is it to restructure a data file once you have it in place, Marion? In the particular systems I use, it's quite hard, because once I've set those fields, I'm in a sense, trapped as Arnold was with the early database he worked with. I can't change those fields easily once I put the data in. I'd have to restart from the beginning and rekey all the data. I think one of the, the things about a computer is that the boring part is typing that information in. You should never have to do that again if you've done it once. And, and it's worth spending the extra money on a database that will allow you to avoid that. I'd have okay. to agree all the time. Okay, what, what do you think about the uh, question of buying your database versus typing it in yourself or inventing it? Do you have any preferences? The most powerful ones be, would be very difficult to duplicate on your own, especially in the early stages of using a microcomputer at home. The more simpler ones, such as Marion has used, I think you could certainly acquire on your own. Mine are bought. Okay, very quickly to the whole panel, what advice would you give people who are hoping to implement a data system on their home computers. What would you tell them? Don't underestimate the amount of storage that you may need to store all of those records. All right. Think a lot about what you want to put in and what specifically you want to get out of it. Save a little extra money and spend it on the database so you can get something that'll do what you want. That's something you haven't thought of in advance. Good. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you to Marion and Andrew and Arnold. And we'll take a short break. And Jim and I will be right back. On Bits and Bytes next week, Computer Talks to Computer. Billy Van and Luba Goy will show us modems and how modems are used to get in touch with an electronic bulletin board and a large database. That's at 9 p.m. On the Academy at 9.30, I'll be here with Jim Butterfield and guests for more demonstrations and exploration. So next week, watch Bits and Bytes at 9 and join us at 9.30. Jim, these are the questions that have come in by mail and phone since our last program. First one, sometimes you talk about binary computers, sometimes about digital computers. Are they the same thing? Yes, they are. The terms mean slightly different things, Jack. Digital means based on a certain count, such as you could have two cats, or you could have three cats. Those are digits that I'm holding up at the moment. But you can't have two and a half because the number has to be an even number, what mathematicians call an integer. Now, binary means about the same thing, except you only have two values, on or off, yes or no, one or zero. But for computers, they mean essentially the same thing. Thank you. Second one, I have a calculator which doesn't lose its memory when I turn it off. Why do computers always lose their RAM memory when the power is turned off? Well, the way that calculator works, Jack, is that there's a tiny trickle of current still coming from the calculator's battery keeping the memory alive. It's not very much, and it won't drain the battery terribly fast, but it needs that extra current. Now, there are computers, portable handheld computers now, that have batteries inside them that will hold their memory, but generally on most computers it's not needed so much because you have disk and tape to save the information that you want to store when you turn the computer off. Several people have asked this one. You have talked about maintenance of the cassette tape unit, cleaning and demagnetizing the heads and so on. Could I also use the cleaning kits that are available for disk drives? Well, I would check with the manufacturer first on this one. 
Some manufacturers of disk drives say that there's perhaps a little bit too much friction, a little bit too much, uh, it's a little bit too heavy to use it on some of their drives. So check very carefully as to what the manufacturer or the disk drive manufacturers say. If they say to use the cleaning kit, then go ahead. All right, here's one from a Vic owner. I loaded a video game into my Vic and said lift to see how the program worked. Nothing. Where's the program? Well, list is a basic command, and list is intended to show you a basic program. But if your program is not written in basic, list isn't going to do you much good. Now, what you'd need to do, the, the program is undoubtedly written in some other language, uh, perhaps machine language and perhaps uh, some language like force, but you'll need to know that language and know how to bring that program out if you want to see it. List won't do it if it's not basic. Jim, this, not, this is not for me this time, but it says you're still holding out on helping me select the computer. How much RAM memory will I need for my computer system? Well, there's still no easy answer. It still depends upon what you want to do. But let me try to be a little more specific here, Jack. RAM is used for holding programs. So the first thing is, if you plan to have really big programs in your computer, then you should look for a computer that will give you a lot of random access memory RAM. At the same time, RAM is also used for holding data in large groups when you need it held in the computer in that way. Now, we should point out, as we mentioned before, that when you have data on disk or on cassette tape, you can bring it in a small piece at a time and handle it quite nicely. But sometimes you do want a lot of data in the RAM of your computer. For example, you want to sort a large amount of information, and it's nice to have it right there in your memory. If you plan on that kind of an application or big programs, then look for a lot of RAM. If in doubt, probably buy more RAM because RAM's relatively inexpensive now. All right, here's one from the student. I have an Apple II Plus computer at school. If I press the wrong key by accident, it says syntax error. I know what an error is, but what does syntax mean? Well, syntax really just means that the computer can't figure out what you're trying to say. It really can't make any sense out of what you're saying. For example, if I typed into the computer an expression such as a equals 5 plus, the computer wouldn't know what to make of that at all. It would say, well, perhaps they didn't mean the plus, maybe they meant A equals 5, or maybe they meant A equals 5 plus 6, or perhaps the plus sign should have been a <coughs> It can't really make out what the mistake is. It can't tell you what the mistake is, so it gives you the general thing, syntax error, which means I can't make any sense out of it. All right. One more, Jim. In a recent program, someone typed in a command which used opening quotation marks, but no closing quotation marks. It seemed to work, but it doesn't work on my computer. What's going on? Different computers have different rules, Jack, and I'd like to illustrate some of those rules on the screen of this computer. For example, suppose you have a program called Hot Dog and you want to load it into the computer, and some computers you're allowed to say, load hot dog, no quotes at all. Now, other computers require that you type quotes around the name Hot Dog to set it up. That's a name, not a command. Finally, on a few computers, you're allowed to say, load hot dog, and if you don't close the quotes yourself, the computer will close it for you. So you have a choice. It depends on your computer. Thanks very much, Jim. That's all the time we have for this program. Next time, computers talking to other computers. Jack Livesley with Jim Butterfield inviting you to join us then on The Academy.